gentlemen, we want to announce the arrival of Miss Loretta Young. Good evening, folks. This certainly is a big crowd and heaps of light and lots of fun and excitement. This is here, the Rainbow Girl. Thanks. Thank you so much, Miss Young. Thank you. These are the fantasy heroes and heroines of our time. They are the idolized purveyors of illusions, the myth-like vendors of dreams. They are the public's own creation. For more than 50 years, glorified and adored. They are stars. Monroe. These are only two of the magical names that conjure up almost a lifetime of wondrous illusion. They are among a handful of unique personalities who belong on the roster of great stars. Those in whose images audiences over the years have found some elusive fulfillment. The climate that produced them has changed, but the affection born out of need for them remains. This is essentially a love story. A story that begins when there were no stars. In 1910, there is magic in the flickers shown at neighborhood Nickelodeon, but the players have no names. Who is the adorable little girl with the curls audiences demand to know? Movie producers fear that fame for players means higher salaries, but public clamor forces them to relent, and Mary Pickford, the movie's first great star, is born. Now Hollywood eagerly satisfies the public's demand. Pictures with stars make money. Charlie Chaplin becomes the greatest silent film star of all. The universality of his comic genius makes him the folk hero of the world. the heroic types that will become movie traditions. Douglas Fairbanks is the swashbuckling hero. In The Mark of Zorro, he boldly sets the pattern for others to follow. Friends, you've come to Nottingham once too often. When this is over, my friend, there'll be no need for me to come again. Errol Flynn carries the Fairbanks tradition into the talkies. In films like Robin Hood with Basil Rathbone, he becomes the screen's most dashing hero. Your sword, Gisborne. <laughs> Valentino, the sheik of the silent screen, sparks a revolution in romantic technique and creates
creates a model for Latin lovers. The man with the bedroom eyes, Charles Boyer, becomes the modern exponent of exotic love in Algiers with Hedy Lamar. You're beautiful. Do you know what you are to me? Thanks. That's you. Thanks. With you, I escape. Follow me? The whole town. It's spring morning in Paris. You're lovely. You're marvelous. Close your eyes. Listen. Can you hear it? That's my heart beating. Does it go like a subway train? Faster. Hart, the first great westerner, introduces the prototype for the American cowboy hero, the strong, silent type. When the movies begin to talk, Gary Cooper, in films like Samuel Goldwyn's The Westerner, is a man of few words. He is one of the last screen heroes of truly heroic stature. Well, uh, what makes you think we'd take your word? Take it or leave it. Pardon? You're a sneak and a liar. hero, larger than life, dominates the screen until John Garfield breaks the mold. He creates a new screen hero, life-size, vulnerable. He's the man in conflict with a world he never made. They've been at me now nearly a quarter of a century. No let-up. First they said, let him do without parents. He'll get along. Then they decided, he doesn't need any education. That's for sissies. Then right at the beginning, they tossed a coin. Heads, he's poor. Tails, he's rich. So they tossed a coin with two heads. Then for the finale, they got together on talent. Sure, they said, let him have talent. Not enough to let him do anything on his own, anything good or great. Just enough to let him help other people. So all he does, well, you put all this together and you got Michael Bogart. Marlon Brando is the rebel, an unromanticized hero. He is a product of his times. In On the Waterfront, with Eva Marie Saint, he expresses the frustrations of a new generation. He wanted my philosophy of life. Do it to him before he does it to you. I never met anyone like you. There's not a spark of sentimental. Romance or human kindness in your whole body. What good does it do you besides get you in trouble? Listen, down here, it's every man for himself. It's keeping alive. It's standing in with the right people so you get a little bit of change jingling in your pocket. And if you don't? If you don't, right down. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, in the mind. What's that you playing? Oh, just a little something on my own. Oh, well, stop it. You know what I want to hear. No, don't. You played it for her, you play it for me. Well, I don't think I can remember. If she can stand it, I can. Play it. Yes, bro. <laughs> screen heroes are those with whom most people can identify. Such is Humphrey Bogart. 
tough guy, loner, cynical hero of a cynical time. Men like his toughness, women respond to an innate tenderness. And as time goes by, through 20 years of his films, they affectionately call him Bogey. The petrified forest, the role that makes him a star. They drive by night with George Rapp. The Maltese Falcon with Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet. Casablanca with Ingrid Bergman. The Treasure of Sierra Madre with Tim Holt and Walter Houston. Key Largo with Edward G. Robinson. Dark Passage with Lauren Bacall. The African Queen, for which he wins an Academy Award. Captain Queen in the Kane Mutiny. Classic team in a classic scene, Bogart and Bacall, to have and have not. What do you do that for? I've been wondering whether I'd like it. What's the decision? I don't know yet. It's even better when you help. You know you don't have to act with this to you. You don't have to say anything and you don't have to do anything. Not a thing. Oh, maybe just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. the most glamorous star of motion pictures, Miss Jean Harlow. She will be interviewed by your Hollywood on the air tattler, Jimmy Fiddler. Jimmy Fiddler! The Hollywood on the air tattler. Give me full credit when you mention my name. Jean, I'm so glad to see you again while well, I could kiss you. Uh, well, uh, Jean Harlow is the sex queen of the 30s. Her platinum blonde hair, the high gloss of her makeup, attest that she is a product of the star system. Trained, molded, promoted, manufactured. But it's her own special magic that makes her a star. Girls who try to emulate her success find it takes more than a pretty face and a miraculous tape measure to be a Jean Harlow. Yet still they come. Girls from the cities, girls from small towns, high school cheerleaders, dance and beauty contest winners, even their runners-up, all hoping against hope for the chance to be put through the star-making machine. One in a million has that magic. Ginger Rogers. She dances to fame as the partner of the one and only. Another young dancer, Rita Hayworth, makes her bid for stardom with Fred Astaire. Would you like to try it with me? I'd love to. Uh, Tommy, let's have the second 24 bars. Ready? One and two and. A star's publicized private life must conform with her screen image. Rita Hayworth, the love goddess, can do no wrong. 
fit for a king, her highly publicized romance with the playboy prince meets with little criticism. It merely provides her fans with a vicarious thrill. And when she becomes Princess Rita, she has truly consolidated her position as the goddess of love beyond compare. When she returns to America, she finds an eager public waiting and hotter than ever, resumes her career as Miss Sadie Thompson. The heat is on, the heat is on. You're gonna hear the sirens howl tonight. You're gonna see the building bounce. Because the lady's on the prowl tonight, and it behooves me to announce the heat is on. Bergman projects a very different personality. An enormously popular star, she is a symbol of nobility, purity, wholesomeness, and her screen roles support that image. The press calls her Saint Ingrid. When Bergman's love for the Italian director Rossellini does not seem to coincide with her established image, her fans desert her, and the once beloved star is banished from the screen. Not for almost 10 years as she accepted again in American films. Upon her return, she candidly comments on her experience. Do you think that the Europeans in general are uh, more sensible about their attitude towards life and towards public figures than Americans? Yes, they are. But I am sure of because they live and let live. And all that counts is what they go and see and uh, what they, you know, what they pay for. They want to see an actress because she gives a good performance. But whatever she does in life, it's... Uh, you mean it's where... Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Did you have any uh, criticism of the way the press in general handled the story of your life? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, I had some criticism of it, because I think that the person has to have a private life. But I also know that if you choose being an actress, you have to take both sides of the coin. One great star refuses to compromise, Greta Garbo. She fanatically guards her privacy, flees all publicity, and becomes a legend of glamour and mystery. And even in her retirement of more than 20 years, she is pursued as ever before. If anything, the legend of Garbo grows with the years. Of her need for privacy, she once explained, I've never said I want to be alone. I only said I want to be let alone. Few stars' private lives are as public as Elizabeth Taylor's. Her marriages, divorces, even her illnesses project an exciting reality that makes her movie roles merely extensions of her private life. Elizabeth Taylor becomes the world's highest paid star. Although she is beautiful and talented, the financial success of a $40 million production may center on public interest in her romance with her leading man. Unlike Garbo, the spotlight on her private life helps create the legend of Elizabeth Taylor. Chuff sees the stars. 
In September 1959, the Soviet premiere misses out on a trip to Disneyland, but does get to visit a Hollywood set. In the presence of stars, even world leaders become reduced to movie fans. So has it always been. Charlie Chaplin greets Winston Churchill and treats him to a special performance. Screen star Marion Davies guides George Bernard Shaw through Hollywood on one of his rare visits to America. Britain's Field Marshal Montgomery visits with John Wayne and Greer Garson, while Yul Brynner welcomes the King and Queen of Siam. Greek royalty meets Hollywood royalty. Humphrey Bogart, June Allison, and Dick Powell. One queen greets another. Britain's Queen Elizabeth, Hollywood's Marilyn Monroe. Most fans must view their idols on the screen. But this is where the true magic lies, especially the magic of the great stars, the indestructibles, who through the years never wear out their welcome and who seem to endure forever. Well, how about you, Tom? Kind of new stuff for me. Well, you gotta grow up sometime. For three decades, James Cagney's dynamic personality vitalizes the screen. In 1931, his career as a public enemy begins. With best wishes for a prosperous New Year. <laughs> Cagney gets his first gun and embarks on a remarkable screen life of crime, violence, and mayhem. Spencer Tracy, the actor's actor. In the early days of sound, his intensity and rugged warmth are conveyed in films like Man's Castle with Loretta Young. Bill, why do you always keep looking through that hole for? Why? When you're dead, you get a hunk of earth. When you're alive, you want to hang on to your hunk of blue. That's all I got in the world. That's all anybody's got is that hunk of blue. You know, I never noticed it before, but your eyes are sky color, sort of. You got a hunk of blue in each little limb, ain't you? But that don't stop me from clapping you on the chin any minute. <laughs> Climb in here. <laughs> That a wicked law like Colin. Stanley Kramer's Mad Mad World and Inherit the Wind richly reveal Tracy in his vintage years. Can't you understand that if you take a law like evolution and you make it a crime to teach it in the public schools, tomorrow you can make it a crime to teach it in the private schools, and tomorrow you may make it a crime to read about it, and soon you may ban books and newspapers, and then you may turn Catholic against Protestant and Protestant against Protestant, and try to force your own religion upon the mind of man. If you can do one, you can do the other, because fanaticism and ignorance is forever busy and needs feeding. Catherine Hepburn, her unique beauty and style, her quicksilver personality, and her radiant youth first enchant audiences in the early 30s when she appears in Morning Glory with Adolph Maju. I should have taken better care of you, not let you get lost. Let's not talk about that, please. You mustn't think any more about it, really. It's been so beautiful, just as it's been. I'm glad you feel that way about it. And it's going to be so much more wonderful now. You'll be so proud of me, really, you will. 
I can be so wonderful for you. You see, you're in my heart. A quarter of a century later, Hepburn's magic remains undiminished. In summertime, with Rosanna Brazzi, she weaves her familiar spell. evening I came here. First time I saw you, you were wearing a yellow tie. I don't want to forget any of it. Not a single moment. I don't think I After year, Cary Grant compounds his own legend of durability. A teenaged Elizabeth Taylor represents but one generation of women affected by the charm and elegance he displays on the screen in comedies like The Awful Truth with Irene Dunn. The Hello there. And what are you doing in my apartment if I'm not too inquisitive? Well, I thought after that swell reference I gave you, I ought to have a drink. Wish I'd mixed it for you. I see what you mean. I certainly do appreciate all those charming things you had to say about me. If ever I get the chance, I hope I can do as much for you. Oh, it was nothing at all, Lucy. I try to go through life. I know, spreading a little sunshine as you go. No, I've come out from behind those clouds. I, uh, I've taken a definite turn for the better. <laughs> Nothing's gonna hurt me anymore. <laughs> Too bad, Jerry. I'll just hurt you, Mud. Oh, no, no. <laughs> just the one hand? Yeah, just the one hand. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll be going. I always like to leave people laughing. Uh, are you sure there's nothing I can get you for? No, no, I'm a stout fellow. I'll carry on. Oh. This is the face of a star. Forty years on the screen cannot dim its luster. She is Joan Crawford consummate symbol of the movie star. She is her own creation. It's in the mid-twenties, in the silent era, that Lucille Lesseur, former chorus girl, becomes Joan Crawford, set on stardom, determined to improve herself. Almost overnight, she emerges as one of the most popular stars of the jazz age. In talkie, she reveals her emotional power in rain with Walter Houston. You've got to go back to San Francisco. Straight orders from your private Helena. Oh, no, Mr. Davis. Your God and me could never be shipmates. And the next time you talk to her, you can tell him this for me, that Sadie Thompson is on her way to hell. Stop! This has gone far enough. Oh, no, it hasn't gone far enough. You've been telling me what's wrong with me. Now I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. 
You keep yelling at me to be punished, to go back and suffer. How do you know what I've suffered? You don't know, you don't care, and you don't even ask, and you call yourself a Christian. By the 40s, the self-styled Crawford is an Academy Award winner and appears in Humoresque with John Garfield. You play like a calliope. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Now, there's an original answer for you. He begs my pardon. You're not by any chance the man who got up and gave his seat to the lady on the subway, are you? <laughs> <laughs> or do you come from the provinces? I was born in New York. Oh, here's that rare animal, a New Yorker from New York. New York is full of all kinds of animals. Not all of them were born here. Bad manners, Mr. Boré, the infallible sign of talent. Shall I make a prediction? Soon the world will divide itself into two camps. Pro-Boré and anti-Boré. One, two, three, four, five. As you can see, size or brute strength mean absolutely nothing against judo. From the very beginning... In The Caretakers, no nearly use. 20 years after Humoresque, almost 40 years after her movie day, Joan Crawford, the personification of the words movie star, is still at the top. Buddy, let's go see what all this ruckus is about. John Wayne heroically endures through countless grade C westerns in the 30s to become one of the movie's all-time box office champions by the 60s. His 162nd film, McClintock, is grade A vintage Wayne. Now, We'll all calm down. Boss, he's just a little excited. I know, I know. I'm going to use good judgment. I haven't lost my temper in 40 years. But Pilgrim, you caused a lot of trouble this morning. Might have got somebody killed. And somebody ought to belt you in the mouth. But I won't. I won't. The hell I won't. <laughs> In The Man Who Played God, Betty Davis supports George Arliss in her first major role. Ahead, a career that will span more than three decades and a gallery of dramatic portraits unrivaled on the screen. Her mannerisms become her trademarks. Whether she play witch, wench, or queen, Betty Davis becomes undisputably the first lady of the screen. Oh, you cheap, petty bookkeeper, you. Every time I think that those soft, sticky hands of yours ever touch me, it makes me sick. Sick, do you hear? You're everything that's repulsive to me. Your wife. I've never been a wife to you, you poor, simpering fool. If you had any pride, if you were a man instead of a drooling milksop, you'd throw me out and be ashamed to admit that you'd ever married me. Keep away from me. I hate you. I hate the day I married you. I hate everything about you. I'd like to kiss you, but I just washed my hair. Bye. My father drank himself to death. My mother lives in Paris. I take a great deal of exercise. I'm accustomed to a reasonable quantity of tobacco and alcohol. I'm said to have a sense of humor. Michael, you might fold up and I might fold up. That horse has the breeding. Well, I... I think I have a large order of prognosis negative. You're a riffraff and so am I. You belong to me and you're gonna stay with me. Get that, you're gonna stay with me because I'm holding on to you. Well, I committed murder to get you. Mac, I've always wanted to ask you something. Have you ever killed a man? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. I hope the two of you will be very happy. <laughs> I never knew from day to day who my mother was. <laughs> Shook me nerves. Oh, I'm bad for people. I don't mean to be, but I can't help myself. So I'm being generous to you, girl. Kind. Kind than I've ever been to anybody before. But I can't be much longer. <laughs> Get drunk. God 
bless everybody. Over the years, Betty Davis becomes a popular subject for imitation. But the range, the power, the electric personality belong to the screen's great lady alone. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I am here just as a spectator. I want to see Gone with the Wind the same as you do. And this is Margaret Mitchell's night. Clark Gable, the king, the most popular male star in the history of the talkies. His rep butler in Gone with the Wind is a milestone in the career he began as an extra in the silent era. In his sound debut, The Painted Desert with William Boyd, he plays a villain. All right, Holdrup. Here it is. I did everything. Wagons, mine and all. And I'd do it again. If you or any other man come between me and what I want. But suppose nobody stops. Roguish, direct, Gable soon becomes the American symbol of manliness and wins an Academy Award for his performance in It Happened One Night with Claudette Colbert. There's no end to your accomplishments, is there? You think it's simple, huh? No, no. Well, it is simple. It's all that old thumb, see? Yeah. Now, some people do it like this. Or uh, like this. All wrong. Never get anywhere. Oh, the poor thing. Yeah, boy, but that old thumb never fails. It's all matter how you do it, though. Oh, that's amazing. Hmm? Yeah, but it's no good, though, if you haven't got a long face to go with it. Here comes the car. Make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're such a smart Alex. Nobody knows anything but you. I'll stop a car and I won't use my thumb. What are you going to do? The system on my own. In a remarkable career that spans 30 years, he makes the Gable kind of love to Hollywood's most glamorous leading lady, Norma Shearer, Jean Harlow, Joan Crawford, Greta Garbo, Myrna Loy, Carol Lombard, Loretta Young, Vivian Lee, Hetty Lamar, and into another generation, Lana Turner, Ava Gardner, Grace Kelly, Sophia Loren, and Marilyn Monroe. With Marilyn Monroe in The Misfits, Gable, the soft-hearted tough guy, the durable rogue, plays his last role. You're a real beautiful woman. It's almost kind of an honor sitting next to you. You just shine in my eyes. That's my true feeling, Robin. What makes you so sad? I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. First man never said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. That's because you make a man feel happy. As the world's greatest sex symbol since Harlow, it is Marilyn Monroe's role in life to make people happy. She's the blonde all gentlemen prefer. She's all 
the it girls, oomph girls, golden dream girls rolled into one. She's Marilyn Monroe, superstar. <laughs> time job. Her private life is public, her public life is publicity. This is the price a symbol pays. And these are the sights and sounds in the life of Marilyn Monroe. becomes a thing, said Marilyn Monroe. I just hate to be a thing. The Misfits is destined to be not only Gables, but also Marilyn Monroe's last film. The passing of great and beloved stars often comes as a personal blow. Such is the impact of their personalities on our imagination but they leave behind a rare legacy. That legacy may be found in their films, for on the screen, their unique magic is immortal. I bless you, girl. Person in the world. But sure, 
child who could be brave from the beginning. I was scared too when you asked me. But I'm not so much now, are you? No. How do you find your way back in the dark? Just head for that big star straight on. The highway is under it. It'll take us right home. Extraordinary excitement of a great star, Judy Garland, and I could go on singing. Thank you, blue bird. Happy, happy blue bird. Mr. Blue bird. Hello. star system that produced Garland, Gable, Monroe, no longer exists. Hollywood's younger people today, some just now aspiring to stardom, others already reaching for greatness, will not easily become the Garbos and Gables of tomorrow. But by their films, the public shall know them and decide. The great singing star turned actor, Frank Sinatra, in Come Blow Your Horn. The ingenue turned comedian, Debbie Reynolds, in My Six Loves. Geraldine Page and Dean Martin in Toys in the Attic. Anthony Perkins and Sophia Loren in Five Miles to Midnight. Academy Award winner Jack Lemmon in Irma La Douce. Shirley McLean in Two for the Seesaw. Hope Lang in Love is a Ball. Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia. The young Sue Lyon in Lolita. Yvette Mimeo and James Darren in Diamond Head. Nancy Kwan and Pat Boone in Main Attraction. Some of these performers may be eligible for future greatness. Only the public can tell. For as in the beginning, it's the public that creates great stars. The old system that produced the great stars has passed. But the need to identify with the heroes and heroines of this screen will always remain. Perhaps there may be fewer stars in the future, but it's certain that from time to time, in a darkened theater, something like a miracle will happen. When a sudden excitement, a sense of recognition, and then a feeling akin to love will mean a great new star is born. This is Henry Fonda. Good night.